Bonjour. Uh, thank you to... Merci d'être parmi nous jusqu'au jusqu repas de midi. J'espère que vous n'allez pas regretter le repas manqué. Je m'appelle Guillaume Tourner, je suis de Grenoble-Alpes-Métropole et ma collègue Sylvia Pintarit vient de Munich. Nous nous avons proposé cette conférence pendant la, le festival pour deux raisons. Premièrement, car nous pensons qu'il est important de parler de ce qui se passe euh, en ce qui concerne les villes de l'Europe, quels sont leurs rôles, quelles sont leurs places et comment est-ce qu'on peut gérer la politique européenne euh, en ce qui concerne les territoires. Et deuxièmement, nous avons eu l'occasion que Sylvia vienne ici dans le contexte d'un projet européen sur les infrastructures vertes et elle était là et donc c'était une occasion pour nous d'avoir une discussion. Nous sommes les responsables de politique européenne pour nos villes, nous ne sommes pas des experts universitaires, nous ne sommes pas chercheurs, nous sommes des praticiens et nous voulons vous donner notre vision de ce sujet en 45 minutes et puis on aura le temps de prendre des questions, mais pour l'instant, nous allons démarrer. Bonjour. Bonjour. Quelques images pour commencer. Ce n'est pas une carte de l'Europe, bien sûr, c'est une carte des États-Unis et je l'ai trouvée sur Internet. Je voulais voir si c'était vrai ou, ou faux. 50 du PIB des États-Unis est produit dans les 20 plus grandes villes des États-Unis. Et ce n'est pas sur 50 du territoire. Donc, vous voyez qu'il y a une polarisation, une concentration de la production, de la croissance dans des petites parties de, du territoire américain. Et lorsqu'on regarde les zones urbaines fonctionnelles, les villes américaines envoient ce, cette carte qui montre les zones urbaines et ça reste une petite partie dans le nord-est des États-Unis. Et lorsqu'on regarde une carte similaire de l'Europe qui a été créée par ESPON, un programme européen pour la recherche, on peut constater que dans une Europe, on a une structure différente, mais il y a des grandes différences entre pays de l'Europe quelques faits et chiffres et les tendances euh, majeures. 75 de la population vit dans ce qu'on appelle des villes ou des zones urbaines, mais cela comprend également des zones périurbaines. Ce n'est pas juste le centre des villes, mais ce que l'on appelle en Europe les zones métropolitaines ou les zones fonctionnelles. Il y a une grande diversité de taille. 800 villes ont plus de 50 000 habitants, 260 entre 100 et 250 000 habitants et 26 villes avec plus d'un million d'habitants. Et cela représente 13 de la population totale. Les villes sont des lieux de croissance, mais sont également des lieux qui concernent la pauvreté et les défis climatiques. Il y a les problèmes de la circulation, la qualité de l'air dans les villes, mais également dans les vallées alpines, mais c'est surtout concentré dans les villes. Pour l'Europe, les questions urbaines sont de vrais défis au niveau de l'Europe. Je vais continuer. Il y a un paradigme qui dit que les villes sont connectées à la mondialisation et que la croissance économique est générée par les centres urbains. On peut questionner ce paradigme qui est en train de se transformer grâce à la, aux technologies digitales. 
Mais c'est vrai qu'on a vu une forte croissance dans les villes depuis un, un certain temps. Aujourd'hui, en France tout particulièrement, mais pas seulement en France, ailleurs, en Europe aussi, l'équation est questionnée maintenant. Il y a un débat entre les zones rurales et urbaines pour dire que les zones urbaines, euh, rurales sont reléguées et tout l'effort se concentre dans les zones urbaines et les budgets sont concentrés là aussi. Et dans cette zone grise de périurbaine, on sait que certaines zones sont des refuges pour des personnes qui veulent vivre proche des villes, mais qui veulent plus de nature et qui veulent aller dans les villes quand c'est nécessaire. Mais d'un autre côté, il y a des, jeunes, des personnes qui habitent dans ces zones périurbaines car ils n'ont pas l'argent pour vivre dans la ville. Euh, euh, ils n'ont pas les, les ressources pour vivre dans le centre parce que c'est trop, trop cher. Et donc, on doit questionner les politiques européennes et nationales. Et nous voulons développer ce sujet aujourd'hui. Comment cela fonctionne et quel type de solution nous pouvons trouver? Quelle direction nous pouvons prendre pour traiter ce problème? Il y a également un réseau trans-européen de transport pour connecter les grandes villes. Ça s'appelle TENT. Et il y a au moins un projet européen qui traite comment reconnecter ces nodes dans ces réseaux. C'est une tâche importante et c'est ça ne fait pas encore partie du travail du réseau TNT. Pour l'instant, on veut renforcer les zones euh, fortes. Et puis, le dernier point, d'un côté, on voit un intérêt croissant dans les zones urbaines, également du côté européen, car l'Union a besoin de ces zones pour atteindre ses objectifs, puisque la plus grande partie des personnes vit dans les, les grandes villes et que les problèmes sont les plus importants là lorsqu'on veut atténuer le changement climatique ou réduire les émissions de CO2, nous devons travailler avec ces zones. Et nous voulons vous montrer comment l'Union traite ces questions et comment les villes traitent ces questions. Donc, cela vient du rapport sur la cohésion, le, le, le septième rapport. C'est publié chaque année sur la cohésion. Et pour l'instant, on peut voir que les questions urbaines sont traitées dans des chapitres spécifiques. Le, la place de ces zones dans l'Europe. Comme vous pouvez voir, les villes associent les opportunités avec les défis. Ils sont plus efficaces en termes de l'énergie, de l'utilisation des sols et proposent euh, des styles de vie à faible utilisation de carbone. Et en même temps, ils doivent traiter la pollution. Pour la Commission européenne, les régions euh, euh, avec les grandes villes et les capitales, Ça veut dire les zones métropolitaines où, où là où il y a plus d'un million d'habitants. À Grenoble, on a 700 000 habitants, juste pour vous donner une idée. Ces villes sont les, les moteurs de la, con, la compétitivité régionale en Europe. Et les, les, les plus grandes, les régions les plus importantes sont ou les villes capitales ou les grandes métropoles. Et ils sont vraiment des leviers de croissance. C'est un point important que nous allons développer par la suite dans la présentation pour dire qu'on on, on ne devrait pas limiter la description à cela, à être un, un moteur de croissance. Si on regarde la politique en Europe, c'est un engagement progressif au sein de la politique de la cohésion il y a des financements de sources différentes. Et dans les années 80, 
À la fin des années 80, il y a les premiers rapports qui parlaient des villes. Dans les années 90, on a vu des petits programmes qui s'appellent Urban Pilot Project ou ou le programme d'initiative communautaire Urban CIP, 5-10 millions d'euros. Et on avait un projet de ce type à Grenoble à cette époque. Et c'était une manière d'expérimenter et de travailler avec les questions urbaines dans le cadre de la politique européenne. On se concentrait sur les zones défavorisées et ça donnait aux autorités locales la possibilité de développer des actions et des politiques. Par exemple, c'était pour la première fois en France que le, un gouvernement local a pu gérer des fonds européens directement, comme l'autorité de gestion, en parlant, en échangeant directement avec les commissions sur la façon dont on, la ville de Grenoble voulait gérer l'argent, comment dépenser, comment gérer, comment sécuriser la bonne utilisation des fonds. En 2000, le processus a changé car il voulait rendre plus général ces programmes. Et 5 de, du budget de la cohésion devait être alloué aux questions urbaines avec essentiellement les questions urbaines, ça veut dire les, des interventions dans les zones défavorisées avec une approche intégrée. Et à cette époque, en 2004, ils ont créé le programme Urbact. C'était un programme de coopération interreg pour les, les villes. C'était le premier programme de coopération pour les villes. Il y avait un programme de recherche auparavant, mais ceci, ce programme était très développé et se concentrait sur la coopération. Pour Urbact, on pouvait avoir des villes de taille différente de 30 000 à 200 000 habitants. En 2010, on a vu une stratégie émergente avec l'agenda euh, urbain et de nouveaux outils, une approche, euh, une approche urbaine pour les fonds structurels, l'UIA, SCC, donc pour financer des actions euh, innovantes dans les villes, dans les villes de plus de 50 000 habitants pour être éligibles et également le programme de Smart Cities and Communities, c'était un programme de recherche au sein du Horizon 2020. Et maintenant, nous allons encore plus loin parce que la Commission veut développer un nouveau programme euh, urbain pour l'Europe. C'est un travail en cours en ce moment, mais l'idée, comme UIA et Urbac et, et les autres euh, focus urbain de la France structurelle pour donner une visibilité et une cohérence à ce programme pour les villes. Entre-temps, avec l'élargissement de l'Union européenne, nous avons vu un changement dans la manière dont on utilisait les politiques de cohésion. En l'an 2000, il y avait des questions d'utilisation des zones Uniquement quelques zones étaient, euh, pouvaient avoir ces fonds, des zones en difficulté, euh, défavorisées, et l'argent était alloué à ces zones-là. Maintenant, depuis 2007, ils ont décidé d'arrêter d'utiliser ces zones. Toutes les régions sont éligibles. Il y a plus d'argent pour les zones plus pauvres en Europe centrale et de l'Est. Il y a plus de budget pour les projets basiques, mais moins d'argent pour construire des routes des aéroports. Mais pour les autres territoires, maintenant, on se concentre sur la compétitivité et, et l'attractivité. Avant, l'objectif était de réduire les différences au sein des régions de l'Europe. Et maintenant, nous avons ont quand même ces objectifs. Mais le deuxième objectif qui devient de plus en plus important, c'est de lutter contre les Américains, les Chinois et les autres, les autres concurrents pour être plus attrayants et plus concurrentiels. Lorsqu'on regarde les villes 
the Smart Cities and Communities Initiative et le programme de recherche, on, cela se concentrait beaucoup sur cet aspect de compétitivité. Ils essaient de trouver des villes qui peuvent euh, appliquer les solutions des villes intelligentes dans leurs zones urbaines afin d'être concurrentielles avec les villes américaines et chinoises. Cette stratégie était écrite dans la stratégie 2020 de l'Europe pour une Europe intelligente et durable. Il faut rendre l'Europe plus intelligente, plus durable et plus inclusive. Ce n'est pas tout à fait le cas pour l'instant. Quel est l'objectif de la politique D'atteindre les personnes et de gérer les questions à la bonne échelle. Et L'UE a besoin de l'implication des villes pour atteindre ses objectifs. Pour la question urbaine, les deux premières décisions concernaient le pacte d'Amsterdam par les États membres et l'Union qui a développé la the Urban Agenda. On ne sait pas qui a vraiment commencer. C'est un processus très long. D'un côté, on a les États membres qui essayent de pousser cette dimension urbaine. L'Allemagne, par exemple, en 2007, avec le, ch le charte de Leipzig pour les villes durables européennes, mais même avant, dans les années 80, on a vu cette dimension urbaine prise en compte pour traiter les problèmes de la pauvreté, par exemple. Et plus tard, en fonction des acteurs au sein de la Commission, s'ils si se concentraient sur le développement urbain ou le développement euh, régional et rural, il y a une communication sur, de la Commission sur un agenda pour l'Union et puis les États membres ont continué le travail commencé dans le charte de Leipzig avec le pacte d'Amsterdam et l'objectif est d'avoir un nouveau processus à multiniveau, c'est une expérience. On n'a jamais fait quelque chose de cette manière auparavant. Ils ont créé 12 plus 2 nouveaux partenariats thématiques. Et dans chaque partenariat, il y a des villes, des États membres et des acteurs de la Commission européenne et d'autres organisations européennes et des réseaux comme Eurocities. Et ces partenariats se développent. Certains continuent leur travail sur les plans d'action pour mettre en œuvre les idées dans le Urban Agenda. Les principaux objectifs du Urban Agenda euh, sont trois. Meilleur financement, meilleure réglementation et meilleure connaissance pour les villes. Le, le moteur derrière ça, mon, mon opinion au niveau européen, c'est que l'Union européenne a besoin des villes pour atteindre les objectifs en termes de réduction de la pauvreté, de durabilité et également les objectifs au niveau du changement climatique et de la croissance. Quand on dit que l'Union a besoin des villes pour atteindre les objectifs, c'est parce qu'il faut être au plus près de vrais, des vrais problèmes. L'Union européenne est financée par tous les États membres et donc ils travaillent avec les États. Mais depuis 10-20 ans, ils essaient maintenant de travailler avec les régions et au-delà des régions pour travailler autant que possible avec les gouvernements infra-régionaux. Et de cette manière, ils essaient de travailler de manière plus rapprochée avec les villes aussi. C'est une expérience qui continue. Parfois, ils sont en contradiction avec leurs propres objectifs. Mais ils s'organisent en tant que lobby. Et on va vous donner 
un panorama des réseaux de villes qui existent et comment nous travaillons pour essayer de défendre le point de vue des villes. Commençons avec EuroCity, c'était créé en 1986. C'est une association des plus grandes villes européennes. Il y a plus des villes de plus de 250 000 habitants. Il y a des villes capitales qui peuvent être plus petites. Il y a d'autres exceptions. Il ne s'agit pas uniquement de l'Union européenne. Il y a des villes turques et norvégiennes aussi. C'est la voie la plus forte des villes lorsqu'il s'agit des discussions avec l'Union européenne et également avec le Parlement européen. Depuis quelques années, ils ont discuté des questions concernant les villes avant de définir les politiques européennes. Et EuroCities ne travaille pas uniquement sur un seul problème, mais travaille également sur le développement économique, les questions environnementales et donc très différentes questions. Le réseau travaille dans les forums, dans les réseaux thématiques et ils permettent aux villes d'échanger sur les bonnes pratiques et ils écrivent aussi des position papers pour nourrir le dialogue avec l'Union européenne. Il y a d'autres réseaux, également le C40, on entend parler beaucoup de ce réseau dans la presse. C'est un lobby des grandes villes. Le président est maintenant le, la, le maire de Paris. C'est différent de... Eurocities, parce que ce n'est pas européen, c'était créé par le maire, le maire de Londres. Et puis, euh, le, les derniers présidents étaient les maires de New York et de Rio de Janeiro. Ils veulent sensibiliser les personnes, les États, aux problèmes des villes pour essayer de trouver des solutions. Il y a également des réseaux thématiques comme Police sur la mobilité. Il y a beaucoup d'autres réseaux thématiques qui existent. Et il y a également des initiatives qui commencent sur le terrain pour le réseautage. Il y a Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. C'est une organisation mondiale. Il y a 250 villes qui participent maintenant dans ce réseau pour la politique alimentaire en il y a également le Los Dama Memorandum of Understanding sur les infrastructures vertes dans les villes Apil. C'est un, une approche interreg 5P pour les espaces euh, alpins. L'espace alpin comprend les montagnes, mais également les villes comme Munich et Grenoble. Et c'est une initiative de la ville de Grenoble pour avoir un projet sur les paysages et les paysages périurbains en particulier. Et un des résultats de ce projet qui prendra fin cette année était de créer un réseau de villes et de zones métropolitaines pour faire perdurer notre travail sur l'infrastructure verte, y compris les aspects multifonctionnels des paysages et des zones vertes et Grenoble Alpes Métropole est un des signataires de notre document fondateur, un MOU de la coopération sur les infrastructures vertes. Et l'initiative a lieu dans le cadre de la stratégie européenne pour les régions alpines. C'est un processus multiétatique, mais il n'y a pas de place fixe pour les villes encore. Nous luttons pour donner à notre réseau de villes sa, propre, sa vraie place dans ce processus. Mais ce réseau devrait nous aider à le faire. Il y a quatre euh, stratégies, Danube River, Baltic Sea, l'Adriatique, et maintenant la stratégie macro-régionale euh, pour les zones euh, alpines avec 42 régions et 7 États. C'est un bon exemple de montrer comment les villes peuvent agir. C'était un, un projet créé par des États et les régions et nous essayons d'avoir notre place pour être une vraie partie prenante du processus et pour présenter nos problèmes, nos solutions aux territoires 
car une des idées derrière ce projet est que les Alpes ne représentent pas seulement les montagnes et les mais aussi les zones environnantes où il y a des grandes villes avec une influence sur les territoires alpins. Pour vous donner un exemple, il y a la réunion annuelle des acteurs territoriels à Bruxelles, Open Days, où il y a des milliers de personnes qui viennent échanger. Et maintenant, c'est la semaine européenne des régions et des villes. On parle de villes, mais il y a les, les lobbies. Les lobbies forts sont les lobbies représentant les régions et les territoires. Dans les comités des régions, lorsqu'on regarde l'Allemagne, par exemple, 13 des membres allemands viennent du niveau municipal. Ça peut être trompeur parce que l'Allemagne a trois Länder allemands qui sont également des villes et qui représentent les villes, mais ne sont pas compris dans les 13 Mais en tant que Lander, donc les 13 représentent les représentants de différentes associations, de différents types de villes allemandes et de comtés aussi. Il ne s'agit pas juste d'une seule ville forte qui est représentée, qui, qui représente les intérêts d'un groupe homogène. Il y a une vraie hétérogénéité de villes derrière ces représentants. Donc, c'est un peu faible par rapport aux autres pays. En France, c'est un peu plus fort, cette représentation. So this is my talk. <laughs> so there's really a, a huge diversity of cities uh, in in Europe, but uh, oh, but but it might be even bigger in Germany um, when you look at it, because as a, uh, on the one hand the cities and municipalities, which always um, claim that they have uh, this this right for self-government. Uh, on the, on the, and it's true in a way, but on the other hand, they are parts of the German lender. So each uh, land has its own regulations and laws uh, to set the frame for the cities and municipalities, uh, and also the governance stru structures within um, between the different levels uh, vary um, in in the different lender. There are three, and this is the biggest maybe problem, it can also be an opportunity. Three, uh, the, the two of the biggest cities and, and the uh, third city are federal states themselves. So they act in a ambiguous way. Sometimes they have future opportunities as lender. So they are not so, so not the best lobby, lobby groups for the smaller cities which do not have the same competences. And uh, there is only, as far as I know, still only one city region with a directly elected representation in, in Stuttgart, the Regionalverband Stuttgart. Uh, in Fr uh, Frankfurt, there is uh, also a quite good regional cooperation, but it's not as strong as in Stuttgart. And for instance, in Munich, where I come from, we have quite a weak regional representation. So there is a, a by law, there is a regional uh, association and they have um, a plan for the region, but it's quite soft when you look at the text. It says, uh, it should be like this, it should be like this, only very seldom it says it has to be. So uh, although it's obligatory, uh, the, the, the objectives are so soft that it's difficult to really uh, give a, a clear and, and strict guideline to the municipalities and especially to the cooperation between um, municipalities in the region. Uh, there is an ongoing federal reform and <coughs> And cities have been claiming uh, for, uh, and or mu cities and municipalities have been claiming for a long time that there are more and more tasks given to the cities by the federal and the lender governments, but the finances do not match this. So they have their own finances and they have finances they get from the, uh, via the, uh, the lender, yeah, but uh, ne uh, nevertheless, it's even more, uh, always more tasks and not enough money. There are some regulations that link this giving new tasks 
uh, to the finances, but it's not in not in um, operation in every German land yet. Mm. Just one uh, a few figures. I would like to point out that there is a quite interesting um, study from the European Parliament comparing. Uh, all the city structures and, and the municipal structures in the European Union. It's called the role of cities in the institutional framework of the European Union. And those um, figures uh, which compare uh, all Germany and France, but also other cities, uh, you can see here they are included in this text. So please have a look at it. Um, yeah, uh, and we talked about the committee of the region already. And we'll try to put as much as possible references at the end of the document when we'll give it to uh, Festival Geopolitik for, for download it, downloading it. Uh, you wanted to... Uh, the, yeah, one point, and uh, it's a nice picture I would like to show. It's uh, the um, public library and, and a school for adults in Munich. And uh, th what I think is new and has been growing during the last years is that the cities uh, see their role um, and um, th they are very committed to keep up the European idea. So there is uh, also from Eurocity side, but Munich is engaged in it, and other cities also state very recently that they are committed to the European idea. And Munich has this uh, joined this um, initiative, Cities for Europe, and with this uh, public relation thing in in front of of uh, our public library and most recently I think about 600 people were invited to sing for Europe in front of this. <laughs> so the, the 600 came, everybody was invited. So there's, uh, and this is really new because it's not only like the German cities did before and the municipalities saying, well, um, Europe, it's, so, it's okay, but uh, we want to keep our self-government and it's very important, that this is the most important thing. They still say this, but um, but on the other hand, they also, I think, they, they take more responsibility for the European idea. How does it work in France? I will be a bit cartoonish, maybe, but it's just because we have to say things in few in few minutes. Uh, French is also historically a centralized, centralized state with a progressive, very progressive process of decentralization, giving more power in the last year, in the recent years, to the bigger metropolis. This is what we call the MAPTAM law of 2013, uh, creating 15 metropolis in France and plus seven now, reaching 22 metropolis in France, cities more than more, or four, uh, agglomeration of more than 400,000 inhabitants. But uh, it, it gives the idea that a, a metropol power, metropolis power could really exist in France, and this is something which is new which comes from the 2010s years. Uh, I worked for Grand Metropole for 2001 and one, and for the, at the, uh, for the 10 first years, we were in a process where we were something, the municipalities they were dealing, we were kind of syndicate of municipalities, they were dealing small things, but we, there was not a place of power really. And it has changed a lot with the metropoles. But there are a kind of emerging power, but still under control. Uh, there are financial control, uh, you maybe you, you, m most of you are French. Uh, you know about the tax habitation, housing tax is decided by the government at the national level, to to and uh, the reform is decided by government. And this is the money the cities, the municipalities uses, and uh, we don't know what will happen. Uh, also, there is a new financial pact, uh, who ask big government uh, like metropole but also uh, department region not to spend not to increase than more than one person each year of the budget uh, we have the right to uh, increase the budget in uh, in fonctionnement sorry uh, uh, of 1.2 person each year if we have a bigger budget for example 2% two, two more on the budget we will be fined by the state yes but in the meantime, the state develops kind of specific partnership with cities, but choose the priorities he wants to have inside this, this kind of, uh, of uh, partnerships. Uh, more and more, we try to discuss with the states through our association, national association, uh, to choose conjointly the, 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 the priority. And they develop relationship with the, the, with, the, with the metropolis by this way, with the state metropolis pact. 
But also in the priorities, if something who appears for the next five, the last five years, it's to develop region, region at larger areas. Uh, it's a new concern, and we have some kind of injunction of cooperating. This is a state who say that in this program, in this uh, call, you have to cooperate in Grenoble with the Vercor Mountain. If you want to have the money, cooperate with them, or cooperate with Péwaronné nearby. Uh, this is what we call reciprocity contracts, alliance of territories, and the idea is to make us to act at a wider level, larger level, with our surrounding territories. But we know, and it's important we say, when we say that a state, uh, city, are driver of growth, that in France, just to remind you, uh, even if we say that it's weaker and weaker, we still have a very the state has, still have a very strong influence with what we call in French politique de redistribution, redistribution policies. I don't know if you write a, a traduction, translation, but this is what we call social and family allowances. Uh, we are still very powerful to transfer incomes, revenues, from the most dynamic areas, and you understand dynamic meaning cities, for example, to the least dynamic ones. I'm sorry if I'm a bit cartoonish, but it's still powerful tools for the state and to give a control of what happened in city and how the local urban government they could behave and they could develop their policies. And you can see uh, there is a text from a, a, a seminar on metropolization. Uh, they take the same argument, the same text than the European Commission. Uh, the capacity of innovation, the earth of a country economic growth, and ultimately, it's wealth. Uh, and this leads to several questions. And what's inter interesting is a question that how to achieve the best possible valuation of the growth potential through its different cities and its technological and scientific center. And how to simultane simultaneously promote the development of these poles and the spread of the wealth, the scratching on the world territory. It's very important words, the spread of the wealth. I think we are perfectly in time. <laughs> so, <laughs> raising the last questions, um, well, because uh, it's a po it's the um, a point of view of practitioners. Practitioners, uh, we don't give answers; <laughs> we raise questions. Um, so, on the one hand, this urban polarization is a reality, reality uh, which we would like to have balanced, more balanced, and have a more cohesive territorial and social and uh, also economic Europe. Uh, it's, it's a risk to have um, even more uh, a, a more um, polarization. This is something that uh, is, um, I think, incoherent in our way of, of, of uh, dealing with the economy. But on the other hand, it can also, it's, it's not necessarily the case we can, we can counteract it. <coughs> um, well, maybe you, sure, sure. yeah. And and behind this idea, there is uh, the issue that we, we are describing a uh, uh, urban Europe of growing cities, growing power, growing uh, capacity of uh, creating uh, wealth, uh, growth wealth, and connection policy for to connect these cities. I told you at the, as, a, as a starting point that now uh, the main target is to the concurrence with China, United States, that we have to be efficient, economically efficient. This is the main uh, direction of the policies. But what we say is that we will not be economic efficient only, we don't have to be economic efficient only, we have to take care also of the consequences of this kind of policy. When I say we, everybody, <laughs> at the European level, the national level, the local level, the urban, the rural, everyone, the, the researcher, everyone. Uh, that's why we say that it's, it's, it's a risk for rights. To have this aggregation of cities' powers connecting fastly connected by high speed train, by broadband network, by everything, creating a lot of growth, but saying to the other territories that we will spread the growth. <coughs> Maybe you don't have to work just to wait the growth, the, the money to arrive. We spread the we, we spread it. 
We think that w which only works within nations, not within the EU, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because there are, you know uh, there are, um, um, uh, for instance, Germany doesn't like to spread its wealth to Greece <laughs> or <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> inside inside the each country, inside each region, at national level, yes. Uh, but the cohesion policy is a way to spread money uh, to, to exchange. But uh, in, a, in a way, it's uh, it's uh, the, the European uh, Union decided not to have this financial redistribution, but to have the regional policy and structural policy as a way of uh, saying, well, we we don't give you money. What what you said before, uh, we have the growth poles, and uh, those who haven't get the money. That's not working within the European Union. Uh, what they say is, we give you money to develop yourself. Yeah, but it's also very difficult. Yeah. Uh, this is another topic. We could make a one-hour conference on this. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was we 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 believe that more and more with the time, and uh, that we have really to question the, the concept of city as only as driver of competitiveness, creating growth to be spread on other territories. Uh, it's more complex. And uh, uh, we were discussing about the presentation. Where I was speaking about. Uh, we have no uh, yellow jacket in the room. We have uh, only yellow sh sh shirts. Uh, but this is the idea that the people they need uh, they need to have uh, they don't need they don't want to 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 wait for money to from allocation from a uh, uh, allocation to to give them the ability to live. No, they want to live by themselves. They want to make project. And the, the real challenge is to have a new organization, with is to go beyond this growth. Uh, strategy to a sustainable model connecting livable city with surrounding territories. Well, I think that's the point to, to re, um, develop a real multi-level governance which is oriented at developing a new model of economy also yeah because it's not a, cannot be about growth as we had it before it doesn't simply doesn't work yeah and when you look at how people act in in your cities they, you can see that people are looking for high quality of life and that's not necessarily growth yeah in in the traditional sense so there always have been during the last years uh, initiatives or, or even studies to to look to go beyond GDP as indicator for for a good life but there is still this competition with Asia and with the, uh, the, the United States. So this is a process that is going on and it's not clear which one will succeed. And that's why to conclude that we, we uh, as uh, Sylvia said, that a real multi-level but also a real multi-territorial governance. Uh, meaning that uh, we have to exchange each other between different kind of territory and not to have one urban strategy, one rural strategy. We need a territorial strategy gathering, uh, urban issue, peri-urban, rural, uh, alpine, uh, coastal. And we, it's a huge work uh, for, for, for Europe, but we believe, and that's why we also we, we propose, I propose this kind of conference, is to say that uh, don't look from, uh, from your belly. Uh, of your problem too much at your belly. Uh, look at what's happened around you. And uh, that's why when we, when, when we are as a practitioner of urban policy, one of my concerns is also not to be alone to develop our territory, but to do it with other surrounding territories, maybe with far away territories who are impacted by our policies. And it's something important we want to, to, to say uh, in this kind. That's why we are in a project about peri-urban area. Uh, I think it's important to work on the edges of, at the border, at the edges of the urban territories, because this is uh, uh, the urban territories of tomorrow sometimes, and this is a territory totally connected with our central uh, urban places, and we have and we have the same destiny. Uh, we are in the same uh, in the same car. We and and uh, if we want to to. Uh, to achieve the goals of a livable city, it's not only a livable city, it's a livable France, livable Europe, uh, that we have to build all together. Thank you. And, and you, say, I, I, you don't want to conclude. No, no. This was a conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes, and we have uh, 13 minutes for questions. Microphone, microphone, please. Merci, bonjour. I have one question, please. I understand the interest of exchanging models 
development models between various cities, big cities in Europe. But practically, do you have one example of cross-fertilizing experiences between one between two cities or three cities of Europe producing added value somewhere? Do you have one example at least? <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, more than one. Uh, so my, uh, my experience, I've been working with the city of Munich since 2001. And uh, um, our first, my first European project was led by Grand Lyon, by a, a colleague I'm still in contact with. And it was about strategic uh, plans and projects of cities and how to implement it. And we together, it was 12 cities uh, all over Europe, and we, we had a look at how the cities approached um, the, the task of uh, developing a strategy and making it more integrated, working together with stakeholders, uh, yeah, the taking the... the, the um, um, the, the, the metropolitan area into account as well as the, the city inside, the, the neighborhoods inside the city. And th the point is when you are involved in such a project, the first thing that happens to you is that you have to look at your own situation in a different way. Because there's someone from another city and says, what are you doing here? What, why are you doing this? Because when you are working uh, day by day in your own environment, you never question the most basic decisions you take. And this is the first thing that happens. And then you have a lot of uh, real um, ideas and inspiring ideas you take with you uh, in, in, in a case where it works well. But there are projects on the national and local level that do not work well as well. So there are good European projects and, and, and less uh, successful ones. That's the case everywhere. But as far as I know, the, the one of the politicians of Grand Lyon, he visited uh, Munich during that project and he took this idea of the uh, bicycle sharing with him because in Munich at that time we had a very small startup company and they started with this bicycle sharing and I can remember walking with him through through the city of Munich and he was totally interested in what he saw and afterwards Lyon and Paris started with this bicycle sharing scheme they were earlier than Munich as a city because in, in Munich it was only a startup which didn't really function in the beginning. Yeah? So this is a very practical example, but I can give you really many examples. On the other hand, it's true that it's difficult to link the knowledge of those people that are involved in the projects to the day-to-day -day work of people who are not involved. But th um, for instance, with Lostama, uh, and this is, was also with the former project, which was called Integrated Urban Governance for the City of Tomorrow. Uh, I, I talked about it uh, before. Uh, we used uh, the instrument of job shadowing schemes, yeah, of job shadowing. So people going abroad for one week to one month and following their colleagues uh, in what they do. And we have been, I, I think we have had 10, no, was it 10 already job shadowers in Lostama in our uh, recent project? So you ha really have the experience of following what, how your colleagues approach a problem, for instance, like working with uh, the, the municipal, with, with citizens. Yes, um, on Tuesday we saw um, how Grenoble Alp uh, involved citizens uh, in the landscape and in, in, in experiences the landscape and they were so successful that not only 500 people, families mostly came, but more than 1,500. 1, so my colleague who was with me and who is working in the green area department, she was here for a jo job shedding before, she was here now and she will have a closer look at this and we will see how we can transfer this idea to Munich. Another question? Yes, uh, you've talked about the peri-urban issues. Of course, in France it's very important now, but I wanted to know if it's also very important in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. <sighs> 28 countries uh, in Europe in a few days, 27. We are not specialists of each country. Uh, I think that... Uh, there are different levels of matureness on these uh, different issues. 
some countries are functioning maybe way, bit, better ways than the other. For example, uh, uh, we look at Switzerland or maybe Germany or Austria. You have a regional traffic, uh, to, uh, regional to railway uh, who help people to reach the center to reach different places. In Central Europe, because I know a little bit Poland, uh, we are now in the process when where uh, cities we were shrinking, they became growing cities. But they are, go are becoming growing cities by many people living on the edge of the city uh, in nice houses because the land is not so expensive com comparing to the city. And uh, they reach the city by car and uh, they start to have big traffic jams. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, for example, in Poland, uh, you have a tool for the cohesion policy this term period, which is called ITI, Inter uh, Integrated Territorial Investment. And the Polish have decided to develop their metropolitan government by this, with this tool. Because they, they understand that there, there is a, a trend which is very, grow very fastly. And we make a lot of problems. They need to buy highway, to buy train lane, uh, tram, metro lane, tram. It's, they, are, they don't know how to cope with this, to be, to be clear. And they try by creating kind of a, a supra level, very focused on uh, practi practical things now, to, to start to answer this issue. Uh, the, it's, we, in, in Los Dama, we spoke a lot about what is peri-urban areas. I, we had a lot of time about definition. Uh, finally, Perabana Zeras is a kind of very great territory, as I said, uh, between what is a city and uh, what is the rural areas. It is a growing city of tomorrow, in a way. Uh, but that's why it's hard to, to define in all countries what, is can, what kind of territory it is. I, I think uh, one... Um it's important to, to know that in the Central and Eastern European countries, the polarization, I think, is much stronger because the, the growth poles, are, they are developing fast and uh, the rural areas are left behind. And it's, uh, you're right, it's a problem to fully involve them and fully get their... Um, uh, take their interests also into account when it comes to, to common lobbying against the EU. Yeah? But uh, for instance, there, there is a very sad example. Uh, it's Hungary and Budapest. Buda Budapest had a very strong and, and good representation in Euro cities for a long time with, um, uh, by, uh, transported by an ex with an expert from the, from the urban research working for the mayor of Budapest. But with the change of government, uh, he lost this part of his job. Uh, and the development is not very nice. And uh, I had a look at the paper from the European Parliament again. And Hungary is, uh, when you look at the local autonomy index, it's the country with the worst development between 1990 and, and 2014. So it was reduced, not increased. Uh, Okay, this is Hungary. And on the other hand, I know that uh, during this first project I mentioned, Interact, this Integrated Urban Governments of Tomorrow, we had the city of Bruno on board. And I know Bruno is uh, from the Czech Republic. It's a very active city. Um, they are really, and it's a real middle-sized city. Yeah? They are uh, very actively um, um, are um, uh, in exchange with other cities. Um, they had a uh, um, uh, housing renovation scheme with regard to energy efficiency already in 2001 and we, I was totally impressed by what I saw then. So there is a lot of very positive development in some of the cities but this uh, issue of polarization is quite strong. Yeah. And if I could add something, I think that the first part of the year 2000 the main concern was to create attractiveness. What means nice city center for tourism, uh, facilities, amenities for business, uh, offices, a conference center, things like that. And now, with the trends of uh, demographic growth the, and economic growth, they discover finally that the CC center is, is the center of a larger territory. And this is many of the cities that they start to, uh, to, to, to work on that. Warsaw is working a lot on, the, on this issue. 
so far, yes. Uh, but many cities that now they are discovering that they are trying to 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 find to, to start to find solution. Last one. Maybe an example of cooperation between Grenoble Metropole and uh, Vercors. Alors, uh, big topic. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, big topic because uh, we have voted. We as a Metropolitan Council has uh, voted a, a decision in 8th of February, which is the mountain policy of the metropole, saying the metropole is a mountain metropole. It's the first time we say it like that. Uh, and the, this mountain metropole, one of the aim is to build the mountain metropole within the metropole because we have some cities, municipalities which are mountaining municipalities in Chartreuse or in, uh, in the foothills of Vercors, but also uh, because it is a metropole in a very specific context with especially the Natural Regional Park of Chartres and Vercors. And we have a project called, financed by the national call uh, called TEPCV, uh, uh, which is in in, in, in partnership with the Vercor, and we try to on car sharing, hitchhiking solution for uh, for better uh, better uh, a more efficient way of managing traffic within the Vercor and the metropole. This is one very concrete example. It's ongoing ongoing work uh, to, to develop this kind of partnership. We have also partnership on biodiversity uh, with a common observatory. Natural Regional Park, and uh, we were working with them on food policies. Uh, we, are, we are working on food policies with Vercors, Chartreuse, Grésivaudan, Vivoironne, and South of Isère, uh, and a common strategy for food policy from the producer to the consumers. How much money? How much money? Oh, not enough. <laughs> I, 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 Yes, I, I, I cannot tell you, uh, not enough. Of, of, of course, uh, the problem is, uh, I'll say that. There is, too, in my opinion, there is too much money for some investment uh, than for this kind of, uh, of action, of course. But with the help of the structural fund, for example, the ERDF, we try to develop car sharing. Uh, we don't need so many money uh, to develop it. But sometimes with the help of structural fund, or the help of the national call, we have the enough money to, uh, to be able to ask to our decision maker to give the extra money we need to make the project. I think this is uh, for the richer cities. It's, an, it's the most important thing to be involved in European projects and funding is that you have different incentives to act. You have uh, an incentive sometimes to act with your t uh, surrounding territory. In Lostama, we we work together with um, municipal associations dealing with landscape issues. Yeah. Uh, in, a tot in a really new way and also interconnecting the different asso associations by working in the project. And when it comes also, uh, it's also a different way of working when you work on projects uh, in, in the city of Munich in some areas. We are not so used in working uh, f um, with projects. It's more in line working and this is totally different. So we are, we are happy that we have more contact with our um, colleagues in other departments and working trans-sectoral in, in a more flexible way than we do normally. So these are incentives that are, uh, you cannot weigh this with money. It's, uh, it's something, we, we get a little bit of money, we do a lot of work, but we do the work differently than we normally do. The problem with Sylvia is at the starting point, she says, I don't know what to say, and at the end, she never stopped to speak. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love it. I love her for for that. Uh, I think it's time to conclude. We thank you. She has a, a sh bus shuttle to take in one hour <laughs> to come back to Munich. Uh, thank you for listening to us, and uh, maybe next year.